Good morning and good afternoon, and to you, Greg, uh, over in Europe, good night, <laughs> or good evening, good evening, as we would say. Um, I'm Lynn. I'm here today with Greg Fahey, who is the general manager of Softix, which is um, our newest technology partner uh, with our enterprise product. So today's session is going to be a Q&A. Um, Greg is... Um, literally is involved in ticketing all over the world with the Softix platform. So he's worked primarily in Australia and New Zealand, um, but also Europe, uh, South America, Dubai, Asia, South Africa. Did I get them all? I think. Uh, pretty much, yeah. Pretty close? Yeah. Yeah. So I think he brings a really unique perspective um, to the North American market. So we will have time um, for questions. I'm, I'm going to ask him questions. We're really going to have kind of a podcast style discussion here um, where we'll kind of go back and forth. And uh, Taylor is monitoring today. Thank you, Taylor. Um, so she'll be watching for your questions that you can type on the panel. And we may take a pause between sections and see how that goes. Um, so... Uh, We'll we'll get started. I just Greg, just for for starters, what do you do? You know, in your current role as general manager of Softix, um, I know you have a very technical background. I know you have high technical aptitude. But what's really the focus when when you're bringing technology to the world? What do you focus on most? Well, I think the thing we focus on a lot is how we can solve the problems that our clients are bringing to us. Um, we, I think first and foremost, are a ticketing company back home. Uh, we're the largest ticketing agent in Australia and New Zealand. And we build our own platform and we run our business on that platform. And then through Softix, we license it to, to other ticketing companies that are looking for a platform that does a bit more than run your ticketing for a venue or for a couple of venues. Um, there's really only a few of us that provide those large scale platforms that do really big network ticketing and especially that can handle really big volume on sales. Um, there are lots of systems out there and all of them have, have features that are, you know, on their own are great. Um, but what we see coming to us is clients who want to do a little bit more, they need to connect into their market a little bit more. So you mentioned Dubai, um, there in the Middle East, our client is the government and we run our system as a wholesale platform and there are a bunch of ticketing agents in that market that connect into our system and sell the tickets and our system acts as a wholesaler like a, like a travel system would, um, which is quite yeah. different to what we do everywhere, everywhere else. And so um, I guess that's where my technology background fits into what I do now is that nine times out of ten people are coming to us with um, it's a business problem, of course, but they're having real technical challenges in solving it. And um, so we we spend a lot of time understanding what they're trying to do with their business and then coming up with a solution that works for them. Yep. And that really varies, I'm sure, from what part of the world you're in because the ticketing market obviously is different. Um, it's really dominated by the venue here in North America. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've got that whole primary, secondary market scenarios set up and long-term venue contracts and those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've worked with really large events. Uh, the Australian Open comes to mind. Um, just to kind of get us started, what technologies um, are you seeing and used in other parts of the world or maybe at some of those events that you think, you know, we're not, we don't have here yet in North America? Um. I don't know that I would say that there's something in particular that you don't have. I think the difference might be whether it's widespread in use um, or whether there's been really successful examples. And, and the reverse is also true. There are things that are done in North America, again, because the market is different. Um, you know, you'll have teams that own a venue and control all of their ticketing and, and they've got a lot of flexibility to do interesting things because of that. Um, some of the things we do on the large events as a as a ticketing business, we provide a lot of marketing support to those events. That's a big part of our operation back in Australia. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're always looking to do interesting things around how we use data, customer data, their behavioural data, um, their location data within a venue. And, and large events like, uh, like the Australian Open, um, we do a lot of horse track racing events, motor racing events, where you've got you know, hundreds of thousands of people in a large precinct over many days. 
and um, where those people move and what they do in those those precincts is really interesting to the venue, to the event promoter, to their sponsors as well. And so we we use some technologies um, to do that sort of thing, that sort of thing, um, and we also use it. Um, out in public spaces, we help um, public transport um, bodies in different cities track the movement of people towards venues and, and help them with their planning. And so, th so there's a real focus around data and understanding what people are doing, which goes beyond just which ticket they might buy next. It's it's how they're getting to the venue, what they're doing when they're at the venue, um, and what opportunities um, all of the partners in the in the operation, the, the promoter, the venue, and the and the ticketing company have to um, to maximize opportunities there. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think we're just dipping our toe in the water in that here. And and it's some of the really large organizations, like the major sports teams, where they really have the marketing and the prowess to be able to do that, right? To do right. to do something with data. Um, a lot of when you get into mid-sized venues, you have people that have a lot of data, um, but they don't really know how to optimize it and you know what to do with it. And I, I know a bit of the story of you know specifically what you've done around maybe the app and the Australian Open and with sponsors, things like that. But um, talk a little bit about you know what you what you guys have done there in particular, maybe at the Open or other events. I'm not aware of where. How does that work? Where you're tracking where people are going and and what they're doing? You know, what's the technology behind that? Share with us a little bit about how that how that works and and what you get out of that for your for all the people that are um, participants in that. Right. So um, there's there's lots of ways there's lots of ways to go about um, trying to understand what people are doing in a venue. You know, back from you know, someone holding a counter and watching people move around to, to technical <laughs> solutions. And um, a lot of vendors in the venue Wi-Fi space will include a location tracking uh, piece in their solution. They say, put in our Wi-Fi platform, give your, your patrons better access to, to the internet while they're in your venue, and we can also track location. That's one way to go about it. Um, we, okay. use a, we use a technology called iBeacons, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard about. And again, there's different right. implementations of that. We use one that's really super simple on the hardware and venue side. So um, I don't have one right in front of me here, but we've got these things that are a little disc. Um, mm -hmm. They're about about the size of this is not one, but about the size of this thing. So they they're pretty small. A hockey puck, or something. like a hockey puck, um, mm -hmm. and you can just sit them down in the in the venue. They don't need to be connected to any network. You don't have to configure them. Um, you don't have to wire them up to power. You can just put them where you want, and you connect to them with your phone and say, "I want you to track people that come within a 20 meter radius of this beacon." Um, and you can lay them out all over the place. So the sorts of things we will do is, um, you know, at an event like the Australian Open, they have sponsors who spend a lot of money on their on their sponsorship of that event. Right. Um, you know, in the in the tens of millions of dollars, um, several of them, and they want to understand what value they're getting out of that sponsorship, and they have activations on site. They might have, um, you know, Kia is one of their sponsors, so they'll have a bunch of cars there that people can tr try out and take for a little test drive on a track and those sorts of things. And what we can do is we can tell them how many people out of all of those who are in the venue today actually came and sat in a car um, or just went into the area around their car. Um, so they might see that they have, um, you know, three or four thousand people a day coming and and standing outside the car and taking a look at it, but only very few actually getting in. So they might try to rethink their activation and figure out right. ways to encourage people to get into their car and actually take it for and a And how does the know who's sitting in a car and who's walking around? Right, so that's where the app comes in. So okay. um, beacons communicate with, with a mobile app. Um, work They work on Android and, and on um, iOS devices. And so we know... Um, on any given day that of the, so the tennis, they get something like 80,000, 90,000 people in the precinct a day, something like that, I think it is. Um, yeah. And we can we can tell the venue how many people that are in there of those 90,000 have our app on, on their phone. So it might be something like 50,000. Yeah. So we get a sample okay. size. And then we can yeah. say, okay, so, so um, out of our sample of 50,000, 2,000, actually went up and sat in that car, we can extrapolate that out and give them this data and help them understand. And you can do 
you can do some more direct things like you can send messages to people's phones from those beacons and say, you know, show them a key or advertisement when they get in. I think you have to think carefully about where that's appropriate and, and where it's not. Um, but the information that particularly sponsors are getting is, is really useful at, at um, one of the horse racing events that we ticket Emirates is Emirates Airlines is their yeah. big sponsor. And they have um, their cabin crew, you know, in uniform walking all around the precinct. There's no fixed, um, there's no fixed activation. They don't have a marquee, or well, they have a they have a VIP marquee, but they don't have a, a public marquee. They just have the the crew walking around and interacting with patrons at the mm -hmm. event. And we pop a beacon in the pocket of their uniform, and we can see how many people they're interacting with during the day. So oh, that's great. It actually. It actually, you, you can see which parts of the venue people are most likely to interact, which ones at least, um, how long they're interacting for, all of those sorts of things. And, and sponsors find that sort of information really useful. Right. Um, so you think maybe over 50% of attendees um, in, in many cases will, will download the app? Uh, like it, dep it depends on the event. It depends on the event. And, and this is the app I'm talking about in this case is the Ticketek app. And right. as I said, up front, they're the biggest ticketing company. And the, um, you know, Ticketmaster is the other big ticketing company down there. The two of us, you know, are fairly strong in the market um, and very well-known brands. And so people probably have both of our apps on their phone most of the right. time. And so we have, a, we have a pretty large install base. Um, different, different organizations are in different places. Sports teams, you know, an, MDL, an NBA team, um, might have a really good install base, um, whereas you know a, a city theatre might, you know, find it harder to get a big install. But 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 really, you don't need huge numbers to get a valid sample size. Um, yeah. You know, okay. if you can get if you can get up to you know ten or fifteen percent, it's still going to give you useful data. Right. So you can just multiply that out. You're basically saying this percentage of people from your sample size, you don't have to have full participation. I think sometimes people think, oh, you know, it's not any good if I don't have 90% of people that downloaded the app, but um, it's more like it's more like working with polls and things like that. You just have a decent sample size. Right. And that's where the platform, the, the analytics platform behind the, the beacon hardware is right. really important. So if they're implementing proper statistical methods where they're not just looking at multiplying out that number, but they're looking at, okay, of those 10,000 people that did have the app, um, mm -hmm. you know, what percentage fit our um, demographic groups and extrapolating those things out properly, um, mm -hmm. then, then that can, that, that's where a lot of value comes in. So it's not just the hardware, it's also mm -hmm. the platform that's collecting that data that um, is an important thing to look at if you're, if you're considering this technology. Right. Are you seeing that in all the markets, um, that use of beacons and, and the app and getting that kind of data, are you seeing that in South America, over in Europe, as well as what you're seeing in Australia and New Zealand? We're seeing it in Europe a little bit. Um, we're seeing seeing it somewhat in, in the US. Um, the company we work with is an Australian company, but they actually started out in the US and they started off um, doing that thing where supermarkets track which aisles you walk down and, and uh, you know, yeah. whether you get the bread first or last and, and when you pick up your milk, all those sorts of things. And, and they've got a big presence in that space in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and look, I think what we're seeing in events is that um, there's a few people that are giving it a shot. Um, I think some people are a little bit hesitant to do it. They're not really sure how it works. And some of the solutions require a lot of upfront investment where you've got to have all the beacons connected to each other. And that's, that's really complicated to do in a venue. Venues have got lots of concrete and um, yeah. it's hard to lay stuff out and wire it up and power mm -hmm. it and maintain it. Um, so if you can find a technology that's cheap and easy to deploy, I think that's hurdle number one to get over. Right. I mean, all this can be scaled to the size of venue. You know, you go down right. from an 80,000 person event, you can scale it down to a 10,000 seat venue or a 3,000 seat concert hall. Um, right. I think it's, I think what we're learning, what we keep hearing at our venue conferences is you have to have, the, the network is really where everything is living and dying in your network capabilities. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of companies are coming in and just totally having to revamp 
you know, the large arenas and we're all having to up and we just keep thinking, wow, we have to do more access points, we have to do more bandwidth, we have to do more network. And, and the answer really is yes. And there's a lot of companies here in the U.S. that are popping up just to do that. Um, and, and then sometimes, you know, if it's Comcast or someone like that, they're willing to do sponsorships too. Um, we right. see our one of our um, technology providers here, internet providers, is Cox Communications here in, in Arizona. And they work with the Cardinals. And they did, at the Phoenix Cardinals, they did their whole stadium um, and put this whole network out there so they can interact with the fans. But out of that, you know, they got all these ads where you see the CEO of Cox Communications sitting at the stadium saying, you know, look what we did for all these crazy fans. You know, this is part of it. But that's a really big piece. You have to scale it, obviously, to your venue size. But none of this works. Um, I mean, from scanning to everything, nothing works without solid network and that's the constant jump I think is to keep ahead of that for us anyway yeah. here yeah. um you wouldn't think it's so but it is you know it's well we're I mean, soaking it, it is it's it's um I mean you can't you can't um open or renovate a venue without addressing this issue now it's just you know a non-starter right. if you don't deal with it um and I think the the telecom companies definitely have a big role to play because they're not making money off phone calls anymore. They rely 100% on data as a revenue stream. Right. Um, so they so they want you posting on on Twitter and Instagram and and mm -hmm. making WhatsApp calls and all of those sorts of things. Yep. Everywhere you go, including in venues, um, and so there are technologies like Wi-Fi handoff where you move you know, seamlessly from your cellular network to a Wi-Fi network in a public space. And that Wi-Fi network is pub, uh, provided by the telco. And there's a big right. incentive for them to invest in those platforms. Yep. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, it's really nowadays no different from the plumbing. I mean, you don't want your bathrooms to get backed up in your venue and, and, That's true. and access to the internet for your patrons is the same thing. Yep. Um, that, you know, people expect to have it. Um, and, yeah, there's. I think people are still trying to work out: Do I just rely 100% on a sponsorship model, um, like like the one you explained with Cox? Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are used to that in a sense. I mean, we all use free stuff all the time, like Facebook and, and Twitter and what have you. And and people generally understand that when you're not paying for something, you're the product, right? You're going to be advertised yeah. to. You're going to have your exactly. data collected. All of those sorts of things. So that's one way to approach it. Um, you can ask people to pay for it, but when something's like a, a utility, you don't ask them to pay to go to your bathroom um, when they're in your venue. Um, yep. and, and this is kind of the same. I think that um, uh, the, the other side to it, is, particularly as a venue, is, is you've got to say, well, what are, the, what are the things that are important to me as a, as a business and an operation? And what can I use this um, infrastructure for? to improve my business and operations. So you might be looking at how you can get more value out of your um, food and beverage outlets, um, you know, how you can get through through more sales because you have this capability in your venue that might tie into an app. Um, and, right. and, you know, making, making the food ordering process more efficient. It might help people move around the venue more efficiently, tell them which outlets have, um, you know, small queues and long queues and keep people away from the, the busy ones, all those sorts of things. Right. Parking, all of it is, mm -hmm. you know, but all of that again, you know, it, it's all coming back to, to having to have the, the bandwidth there to really do that. But there are companies right. there that are, they know that, especially if you've got a bigger, older building with all the concrete and it wasn't built for Wi-Fi signals. Um, mm -hmm. There's ways to work around that, but there's certainly companies that are coming out to, to be able to help do that. And you know, if you're a smaller venue, it's 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 going to scale down what your needs are, obviously, because you yeah. have less people tapping yeah. into that. And the other the um, other big thing is it's not just what's going on inside your venue; it's the pipe you've got out from your venue to the internet, and and often right. that's forgotten about. You leave the same old internet connection in place, and all of a sudden, you've got much better mm -hmm. connectivity inside. Then all you're doing is moving the uh, bottleneck further down. Yep. I don't remember if I put on here that was just gonna. You know, speaking of apps, I mentioned yesterday of the, the the big fail that Ticketmaster had when they tried to force the digital delivery through their app, mm -hmm. um, and you know they did it too much too much too soon apparently because you know they were going for a hundred percent of 
attendees were going to have to have the app just to get their tickets and right. um, didn't work. But nobody's giving up on it. You know, that's the thing I find is people are very quick to say, well, apps apps don't work because they can crash and you run into a problem. Well, you know, they were really just trying to get 100% adoption on their app was what that was yeah. about um, yeah. rather than convenience for the buyer because they could have easily texted or emailed a digital ticket and still been 100% digital. And, right. You know, so. Yeah, I mean... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Look, the NFL is still going with it. They're, they're still saying, even after that happened, yeah, we're going to do 100% digital, where that's where we're going. I, th so. I think getting to 100% on those things is pretty tough. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I've got four kids. One of them, the oldest, has a mobile phone, but the others don't. And it's kind of a hassle if I take them to a football game to scan them all right. in on, on my phone. I'd rather print out a piece of paper, frankly. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm normally a fairly strong ag advocate for mobile tickets. I think there's a lot of useful things there. But, um, you know, some, sometimes it's more convenient for people to use paper. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the other thing that in my opinion, you always have to remember with this stuff, particularly with large venues, is that operations comes first, right? You can have the, the coolest widget in the world, but mm -hmm. if you've got all of a sudden 5,000 people lined up at your box office windows because they can't get into the venue and, and kick off is in, in 10 minutes, you've right. got a, a horrible problem to deal with. And you just, you need to, you need to, always innovate of course but you have to pay attention to operations and keeping things running smoothly and people have got to get in right that's that's yeah, job okay. number one i look at it we have one job in ticketing you know that's to control access to the building but also to get people in right so that's mm -hmm. that's ticketing at its basic and we can play with it all we want and do some really cool stuff but at the end of the day if people can't get in you know we failed yeah so. And, and, you know, the cool stuff still has a place and mm -hmm. um, you put it in and you try it and you scale it up as you go. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, um, I, I'm not going to say bad things about the Ticketmaster guys because I, I've been there too. We've had stuff that we've done. That's, that's, right. I, I, I don't um, mind that they, that they did that on our behalf. <laughs> and it, and it's, it's no fun, right? I, yeah. I know what that's like. So I, um, I don't want to wish anyone ill luck on that stuff. And the reality is that all of us that are either in ticketing or in you know other other large scale platforms, airline systems, um, the the travel systems, the banking systems, you know payments, all of those sorts of things, um, they have become incredibly complex because people want more and more functionality. They want things to go faster and faster. And behind the scenes, there's a whole bunch of really complicated stuff going on, and it's hard work to look after it and so you've, you've got to really um, I think be careful about it I think trying to go to 100% really quickly is, is tough I think that's often the source of um, where you'll get these sorts of issues I think you can get to 60 or 70 percent at times and, and and you know people talk about using this to you know put a dent in scalping um, mm. in the secondary market and and I get where they're going with that you know we've looked at a lot of those ideas as well but if I was going to do that, I'd say, well, focus on moving your high value tickets to um, digital only, for example, mm -hmm. but also have a, have a, an alternative. You know, if, if, you know, for your, for your 80, 85% of people that are happy with the digital ticket for those high value seats, fine, let them have that. Um, and mm -hmm. then your other 10, 15%, let them show up to the box office and, you know, go through some ID checks and, and get their paper ticket that way. I think you've got to allow for those things um, so the operations still run smooth. Yeah, I've always been for choice because I come back to operations like you do, and I come back to the customer. You know, a lot of times we make we make decisions about something we're going to do, and it's for our benefit or our sponsor's benefit. We're not always thinking about what the end buyer is caring about. Right, so and it can be a pain. Groups, you know. Yeah, I was in I was in St. Louis years ago when Miley Cyrus was doing her first paperless ticketing. So we, were staying, we were staying in a hotel right across from the arena and, and the bar was packed with parents who had to drop their kids off and they're sitting around like, we're not going to drive yeah. home. Right. You know, um, they had to come down with their credit cards and swipe their kids in and it's, yeah, I don't want to do that. That's not customer now. friendly in the end. No. Right. Well, hey, how about anything that you've seen in other parts of the world that just haven't worked. Um, I mentioned uh, when we talked about RFID being kind of a really big deal here right now, especially in the festival market. I think venues are not so much looking at that. 
Um, you know, where do you see that going? Is is that something that you're seeing wide adoption of? I mean, I know it's just a signal. It's just another way to verify yeah. a ticket or something. Um, have you seen it blow up? Have you seen it not? I mean, is it is it as big and is the interest as large in other parts of the world or is it just a North American thing that we're all excited about RFID? Uh, look, it's been pretty big in Europe for a while. I think the, the biggest turnstile supplier here is um, a company that started out as a running, you know, running ticketing for ski lifts and ski resorts. And that's all RFID, right? You, right. Don't, you just come through and the gate lets you through because you've got the, the RFID tag clipped mm -hmm. to your jacket. Um, so, I mean, they were using it here back in the 2006 World Cup in Germany. That was all RFID tickets. But, um, you know, those sorts of events are completely different to everyday events. You know, people don't get their tickets mailed out to them. They have to turn up to central points and collect them. There's all sorts of differences. I think where we, where we are seeing it used more and more is, you know, things like festivals where you've got a closed environment, they control all the concessions, it's a greenfield site and they want to do their food and beverage on there, they want to do their, maybe their merchandise. So they're using it as a stored value thing. Mm -hmm. um, but almost all of the time, in fact, I've got, I've got some tags here from a, a wine festival. Um, so almost all of the time, what we see now is um, there's still a barcode on there. Okay. Right, because that, that keeps things keep things um, sort of simple and practical in terms of your access control solution. And on the you can't probably can't see it, but on the back there is a little RFID chip. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not it's not always one or the other when you when you look at these solutions. And um, you know we work with the guys that provide those tags and. Um, the challenge for us as a ticketing company was always about rolling out all new printers that do RFID encoding, right? We've right. got, I don't know, we've probably got six or 7,000 ticket printers out there in the field. We don't want to replace all of those just so we can do RFID. Mm -hmm. um, so you can always combine technologies together and make them work together. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing is the cost factor. The cost of these things is coming down back when people first started using them, it was you know it was up around a dollar a ticket to do an RFID mm -hmm. ticket. That's come down, but it's still not as cheap as a regular paper ticket. Yeah, compared to you know a nickel, right, for a thermal. Right. right. You know what isn't some of the the beauty of an RFID is is what you said. Like for skiing, it can detect that you're there. You don't have to have a right. person physically scanning, right? So it makes sense if you can just kind of walk through an area. Or again, I would assume it could be used in what we were talking about, knowing where somebody's at as well, right? right? If Absolutely. visiting a sponsor area where if you're really just looking for access control, the barcode on the wristband can work exactly the same. And I think I think sometimes in our market we get confused and we think, oh, wristbands, and then they have to be RFID, but then you're standing there with some piece of equipment scanning them anyway, you could have just been scanning a barcode. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? so. and, and, and you're right, so you can use RFID to track movement. I mean, everything in logistics is tracked that way now, right? So when your box of t-shirts goes through the factory in, in China, there's an RFID chip on the box that says this thing's moving through the factory. Just right. the same as uh, there's a bunch of airports that have, um, you know, you have an RFID boarding pass and it has a barcode on the front, which the airline will scan like they always have, um, mm -hmm. but it has an RFID chip inside and that's tracking your movement around the airport. But the really important thing is it's a different type of RFID chip. That's an active chip versus a passive chip. Passive chips are really cheap. They don't have a power yeah. source, so they're not sending out a signal. What um, kind of chip is on in the, in the airport? The, the, the chip is in, it, it's the RFID chip that's in the ticket itself. Really? So like, a hard, like a hard airline ticket? And they're putting no, a chip in? Just a, just a regular paper boarding pass. Yeah, yeah, a paper boarding yeah. pass. Wow. Yeah. wow. Okay. Um, I don't know if I that it's about it's about ten times the price for that type of chip. So active, because it, it, it has a built-in power source, so it's sending out a signal about where it is. Whereas the RFID that most of us would have come across so far is a passive chip where the scanner itself is sending out the electrical signal and the chip is just bouncing it back. And so it right. doesn't. You have to get a lot closer to those to actually scan them. Whereas if you want to track movement, you've got to have active chips because your scanners will be things that are built into the building, like big gateways that you walk right. through. So it's, it's, it's a more expensive, it's a harder thing to do, but certainly airports, um, you know, large industrial sites, they use that sort of stuff to track, track movement of people, definitely. 
Yeah, I, I, do, I guess I don't really see using RFID unless you're going to track movement um, because if you're really just using it for access and you're going to use some sort of a gadget anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I like it if I'm at, we do a conferences sometimes and you just walk through an area that you're allowed to be in and RFID is great for that yep. as long as it works, right? Yep. But if yep. you're individually still scanning, um, you know, then a barcode, you don't have to change readers, all that kind of stuff, but you can still have that on a wristband like what you just showed. So, so, so sometimes we get mixed up on the format. We think wristband RFID mm -hmm. doesn't always have to be. Yeah, and, and look, it, it really comes down to what you're trying to do. The one place it does work really, really well is if you're doing it in, you know, food and beverage and merchandise outlets and you're in a site that is not networked. So you have devices that can take payment um, and they'll just be a mobile phone. They'll just be. We've got. We've got one here that like will scan one of those. One of those right, cards. Right. It doesn't need to be connected to the internet at all. It can um, take money off the chip, and it can put money back on the chip if you're top, topping up. And there doesn't have to be you know connectivity back to a server or anything like that. So if you've got that right. sort of environment, That's pretty big advantage. Race, race tracks are you know that that can be important. Um, mm -hmm. You know festivals that are out on a farm somewhere where you don't have good connectivity. Right. All those sorts of places, it has really good application. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why they also use it in public transports. So you've got a whole bunch of that's metal true. moving around a city and you don't need to be connected back to the, the central point all the time when people are tapping on and off um, public transport. So it has its place. Um, yeah. But I think you, you know, and, and it's like it's like the beacons, it's like, um, you know, forcing people to use mobile tickets and, and this stuff. You really need to think carefully about what problem you're trying to solve and whether the technology suits and and really get into the detail or something and and what I really see as a challenge is is there's all this stuff out there that people are saying you've got to use this and there's people building apps that do these things and that connect into right. different platforms and different bits of hardware there's so much you could do and mm -hmm. I think people sometimes try to do too much mm -hmm. and you don't pay attention to the detail on those five things you're doing when you could do one thing really well and actually make a big difference to, yeah. to how your, your event works. And I always say bring it back to the basics. In the end, at the end of the day, if you can't get people in the door or in the gates, you, you, it doesn't matter what fancy thing you did because that's, mm -hmm. that's job one. Right? Right. Anything else that you do on top of that um, is great, but it, not at the expense of people couldn't get in the door. Right. We'll buy a ticket easily. But, yeah. Um, yeah. While we're on kind of access control, mm -hmm. not that it's a huge thing, but it's just something I've noticed that um, we've gone away from largely turnstiles here in North America and we've gone to handhelds, which frankly in a large arena setting, I think a lot of people are getting through um, without being scanned. I've watched it happen. I've definitely yeah. observed it. Um, are you seeing, you know, are you still seeing turnstiles in other parts of the world and is the handheld thing something that America is just kind of stuck on? Um, what do you see as far as, as that? And I don't know. It, it's odd to me that we're going to handhelds. Right. Um, I mean, the, the big difference I would say between what I see, and, and, and this is changing a little bit um, in the last few years, but in, in, in Europe, in Australia, um, certainly in Asia, you don't have any security other than the turnstile. So you don't have metal detectors in venues. And, and so the flow of people in, in venues in North America is quite different um, right. to what we see in other parts of the world. That's changing in some places, um, you know, where those things are, are going in as, as people are more concerned about different security issues. Um, but, you know, in football stadiums here in Europe, um, they have to use physical turnstiles. In Australia, we've done it for a long time, and um, I think one of the big factors there is that our labour costs are relatively high. Um, so it's expensive to pay people to stand there and scan and have lots of those people. They'd rather pay one person to look after three or four turnstiles than um, have that number of hand scanners um, with one person right. on each scanner. Um, and you know, cost is a factor as, as well. I mean the you know, it's about four times, three to four times the cost, depending on the equipment you're using to have a turnstile versus a, um, a hand scanner. Now, one thing that has changed is that you get Wi-Fi turnstiles these days, which you didn't in the past. You used to have to cable up, you know, dig up your concrete, cable them oh, up right. and, and, and those right. sorts of things. 
Right. Um, you still have to do that with power, but it's not as problematic as network. Um, mm -hmm. Look, I, I, I don't think there's 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 a hard and fast answer. I, 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 you know, the only things I would say is again, what's important to you? Um, whether it's the flow of people through security checkpoints, um, turnstiles will always physical turnstiles will always be faster. Um, right. You know, we, we get more more people through, no question about that. Um, but they cost more, and they cost more to maintain as well. Maybe if they um, came up with a device that would do the metal detection and act as a turnstile <laughs> and check right. your purse at the same time. Right, be, right. I mean, it's kind of a cluster, honestly, if you get into our larger venues that now have to have the metal detectors. Uh -huh. So you're going through this thing where if you've got a bag larger than a certain size, you've got to put the bag on the turnstile or they're wanding your bag. Then you've got to walk through the metal detector. And, you're, and in many cases, they're not scanning until you're through that. And by right. the time you're through that, I've watched, and a lot of people think they're in, and mm -hmm. then it's up to some person standing there with a handheld to almost kind of grab people and say, I need to scan you now, you know? Yeah. Um, others yeah, put like the, the scanners on the outside of that situation, but mm -hmm. it's just not ever clear where the really, where is the point of entry then? Right, uh, and and, and, and I think your, your, point, your point at the beginning was definitely correct. I would say large, large venues with yeah. With hand scanners only. Just people getting in there. No oh my god. About it. I've yeah. watched it happen. And of course I'm an observer when I'm at large events. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's only as good as your employees and a lot of yeah. times those are temporary event people. Yeah, you know, it depends on where you're getting them from. So Yeah. I mean, we, we we have even venues with turnstiles will have hand scanners there for the VIP entries and and you know supervisor will have one if they're dealing with a customer service issue, all of those sorts of things. And right, we see we see leakage in in big venues as well, even even yeah. those turnstiles. And and it is a problem they're having to address. Um, in in certainly in all of the South American markets we work in, there are fairly strict government controls on ticketing operations in terms of certifying your systems, reporting back to the government about sales and attendance. Um, and so leakage there is, is a real problem. Um, we're seeing, certainly in Australia, um, and I think this will happen more and more in Europe, where venues are government owned, the audit requirements around ticketing supplies are really yep. getting you know more and more complex and onerous. And, and leakage will be a big part of that. Um, I mean, if you think about right. like having a good uh, here, I think it's going to be very quick that ticketing is going to be part of security, and we're going to be required if we're not already in some cases to turn over our manifest to the government in some cases, yeah. or to, yeah. to people that are trying to keep people safe, or they're looking for certain people that they know are there that may be a danger. They may have a tip they're following up on, and if we don't know who's in the building. You know, if we've got 10% leakage on a 40,000 seat event, that's a lot of people that may or may not be known that they're actually in the building. So right. I think we're going to have to tighten up um, and ticketing is going to have to become more secure where we know of accuracy and it's not just for fun that we're scanning people in, but it's actually, you know, imagine if the airplane, if they said, yeah, we're, we're pretty sure that many people are on the plane and they know right. exactly on the airplane, right? right and it's right. a weird thing, and they don't let the plane take off if there's a discrepancy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in in events, we've got a long way to go to that, but it's something that, you know, that we as technology partners are going to have to make sure we're there, um, you know, with the right equipment, the right hardware, and the right technology to make sure that people can actually know who's in the building. It, and it's yeah. going to have to get close to 100%. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in South America, it's been that way with um, football or, or soccer. Um, for a long time, you have to have a national ID or a passport that you provide when you when you buy your tickets. All of that wow. information goes back to the government, so they know. You know, they're trying to deal with hooliganism and, and other issues, um, and th that's been in place for a number of years. And we've had to build features into the system to to collect that data and report it back to, to government. Yeah. Um, in, ter in terms of technology where, uh, you know, people I'm sure have heard about Bitcoin and blockchain and those sorts of things and wondering how they might apply to ticketing. Um, you know, on the front end, on the customer side, there's all sorts of ways it might, but I think this sort of stuff on the back end is where blockchain probably will, you know, 
become important in our industry where um, every transaction that happens on a ticketing platform is verified independently on a platform that's owned by the venue and then by the sporting league or the promoter or what have you and everyone has full visibility of the, the manifest and the ledger at all times. Um, mm. I think that's where that technology will play a role, which is, I think, some, something a lot of people are asking at the moment. Yeah, it's going to have to. Taylor, do we have any questions in that section? We'll pause a little bit. If anybody has anything on access control at all? Nope. Okay, well, my favorite subject is mobile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I, I feel like we've been talking about it, you know, for years, we're not, we don't have it all figured out yet. Um, Europe and Australia adopted it, I think, before we did here. Um, I was pushing for it when mobile sites were eighty or hundred thousand dollars to put up, mm -hmm. and um, it was a little rough. But what do you see as the kind of the overall adoption rate of um, mobile ticketing? And so I guess there's two parts to it: it mobile ticketing, as far as the purchase happening on the mobile phone and then yeah. people selecting to have their ticket delivered on a mobile device. Um, what's what's the overall rate that you're seeing? Um, and I guess you probably know the numbers best in Australia and New Zealand. Um, mm -hmm. What are you seeing for adoption there? Because you guys have always been a bit ahead of us. Um, look, I, I think it still varies a lot from one event to, to another, um, the type of event, the type of audience. Mm -hmm. um, the and, and some some events will get up to you know 85 90 percent of people using a mobile ticket to get into that event and that might be um, you know some of the nightclubs um, you know around six or seven hundred people type nightclubs um, where people are going to see a band we see really strong mobile ticket use in those sorts of places um, I think for our business back home, the, the most interesting target for us was in sports and box office sales. We have big venues and a relatively small population, so we don't have a lot of sellouts on sporting games. The really big mm -hmm. ones sell out, but that might be four or five games a year. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's always capacity and, and people will decide to go on the day and they would buy at the box office. And as I mentioned earlier, our labour costs are pretty high, so pushing people from buying at the box office to buying on their phone um, was a really important thing for our business there um, because it represented a lot of uh, potential savings for us. And so we kept we kept that in mind in, in terms of what we put into our app. We put an alert facility in that reminds you as you walk up to the venue, it checks, checks in your account if you've got a ticket for that game or not, and if you don't, it'll say you can buy it on your phone. And we did price signaling, so we, we dropped the fees on, on mobile tickets and put a fee on at the box office um, nice. to, to right. encourage people to go to that channel. Perfect. And and, <laughs> and, and, and that, that works. It always works. I mean, um, you know, years ago we used to charge people ridiculous amounts of money for printed home and even just not even removing it but halving it took it from, you know, sort of 15% to 50% overnight. So price signaling absolutely works if you want to push a particular... Right, you can drive it channel, where you need ...channel yeah. or delivery method. Um, and on the purchase side, um, we see, again, some events will get up, you know, sort of around 60 or 70% purchased on the mobile. I think probably the more interesting thing is that we see, again, for particular genres, a lot of people will always look at all of the information first on their mobile. So they're, you know, they're um, taking the bus home or they're um, at their kids' sports, you know, baseball game or something like that. And they're looking mm -hmm. on their phone and they're getting emails and they're looking at the information. And then they'll go back and, and buy on their computer. And we see that um, particularly with very high value tickets um, mm -hmm. and a little bit more so with uh, theatre tickets where people are, you know, quite particular about where they're sitting. They want to look at the map. They want to move their seats around. Um, you know, maybe do a view from the seat or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, what what we have seen, and so, so it, it, it's pretty much, I would say, across the board, 90% across most of our genres would, would be um, online, desktop online or mobile. And, and the mix in between those two will shift from event to event. Um, but it's up around 90%. Um, yeah. is online and mobile, pretty much across the board. And I think most interestingly in theatre, that's that's proven true over the last few years as well. We've seen call centre drop way, way down 
Um, yeah. And certainly, certainly our outlets drop way, way down. And, you know, we think we're, you know, we're a full service business. We think you've still got to provide those channels, at least for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. um, and you might see, you know, higher use of voice recognition and those sorts of technologies in, in some of those channels. But, um, um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm a pretty average person. I'd kind of rather do things myself online than talk to another human, to be honest, a lot of the time. <laughs> Right, I know it's funny. I think we're probably around 60% um, percent online overall. Mm -hmm. um, mobile's running, I, I believe, around 30, and that's a broad range, you know, again, across all, it does, definitely depends on the events, things like that. You know, you see yeah. a Comic Con and you're at like 95% online, right. those types of things. Um, mm -hmm. I still have, as a consumer, kind of a low bar. Um, of expectation when it comes to a mobile site, you know, even if it's like a major airline, um, I don't think I've ever bought a ticket online um, for an airline. It just seems like too much information to put in there, even if I've logged in and saved it all. Um, uh -huh. I just have a low expectation. You know, I go in there to maybe look at where I'm at on the upgrade list or something. Um, oftentimes, the, it doesn't even work to change my seat, you know, so um, I think people are still a little bit there. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I've been saying for a long time, it, consumers in North America, I think, are really have sort of technology fatigue. Um, they, they feel overwhelmed all the time, and they feel like they're behind if they're not doing something. And right. so then we see, as venue managers, like this panic almost, like we have to catch up. Oh, we're not doing Snapchat, or, or we've got to add mobile, or we've got to do these things. But we don't always know, you know, why. So, um, you know, it's, it's really something that, that we just have to um, kind of figure out what we're trying to do and, and also realize we're fatiguing people in some cases. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, I mean, you know, with email marketing, people were talking about that fatigue five or six years ago and we were just slamming people with all these emails and it, it, we, none of us have time to read all of that stuff, really. Um, no. and, and again, I think it comes back to doing a few things well rather than trying to grab onto every single thing that comes along and, and, and right. having a go at it. You, you might have a small go at it, but I think generally you'll, you'll get better mileage out of doing a few things well rather than trying to do everything. And, and I think, you know, back on the mobile experience, you're right. It is, it can be clunky and it is hard. It's, um, um, mm -hmm. you know, I would say, screen. Right. When we're when we're building new things, um, I would say ninety percent of the effort we put into figuring out how something's going to work and how it should be implemented is spent on the mobile side of it. So, so someone someone in our business or a, a client, a customer will come up with a good idea, and we say, "Yeah, let's go ahead and do this." And um, you know, we, we get a fairly good idea fairly quickly of how we're going to implement a, a new feature, um, like a like a three D venue map, for example. Right. It's, you know, there's some good vendors out there. There's some good ways to do it yourself. You can go ahead and implement it. Um, and on the desktop, yeah, it's, it's, there's still things you've got to figure out, but it's, it's fairly straightforward. You've got space. You've got, um, yeah. um, you know, people have control over the screen. On the phone, it's really hard to do some of that stuff. It is. And it, it takes up a lot yeah. of time. And if you don't put the effort in, then you end up with a, yep. a, a, yep. a subpar experience. Yep, absolutely. Um, we talked a lot already about the digital delivery. Um, mostly, do you know the stats on if people are picking up their mobile tickets by and large on the app, say in the Ticket Tech market there, or um, are they do they like the the standard delivery email or text? Um, I would say the majority of ours are opening it from the text message. And um, some will some will save it to their you know their, their phone. Um, people use the app as well, and um, the way we've built it is the ticket you get in the app is exactly the same as the ticket if you open it when when it's yeah, SMS. Right. So, you so options, really, right? what's that? Sorry. If you give options to people, then you're going to have less customer service right. at, at, right. at when it's time to get in the building. Right, and so and, and so on that on that theme, what we've what we did, um, uh, I guess, a couple of years back now is that we switched from locking people into the delivery method that they chose when they purchased the tickets and just let them open up their tickets however they want. And so we do mm -hmm. do that everywhere where we have access control in place. 
Um, if you buy a ticket and you say you want print at home at the time and you go into your order history on your phone and you want to open that ticket, we let you open it up and it shows as a mobile ticket. Um, yeah. If you do that on your, on your laptop, it'll open as a print at home and if you walk up to the box office, you can get it printed out and, and we don't care anymore how you ask for it to be delivered. Um, right. And, and you know there were some there were some commercial moves behind that in terms of the way we structured fees with venues and, and those sorts of things. But um, predominantly, it was just about making it easy for the customer because um, you know we'd have people who get print at home tickets and only print the first one out of the four that they ordered, or they yeah. bring their email they bring their email confirmation or you know all the usual problems right. that, that all all your clients would have dealt with at their venues. Um, and so we said, let's just make it easy. Let people open it on their phones and right. get these people away from our box office queue. Well, some of my, my couple of my daughters and a bunch of their friends were just headed to a, a festival a couple of weekends ago here in Phoenix, and they were on their way there, and they realized they just assumed they would be able to have their tickets on their phone. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea why a festival that would be targeting largely a young audience would not do that, but they had to come in and print their tickets, and so they came racing into the office, sending a bunch of emails in different batches, doing print at homes, and I'm thinking, these guys don't even have printers at home, like I don't, right. you know, they use mine, but they, they're always coming over to print, so I don't know, mm -hmm. Taylor, do you have a printer at your house? No, so you know, I mean, it was weird to me. I was like, wow, they all had to forward emails to mom, you know, so right. that I could sit here in my office and print out tickets while they were on the way to the venue. So just an just an example of you know, for whatever reason, that that festival didn't provide an option. I don't know why they would not do phones, but they only had the print at home option. And you know, we've always been just like you, a proponent of. Of customer choice, our idea is to make it easy for people to get in the door. Right. And uh, sometimes, as ticketing companies, we we make that a little harder than we should. So yeah, yeah, a little crazy. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the same same uh, thing happened to me. Lastly, I, we again, if you've got any questions um, for Greg, we only have a few minutes left. Go ahead and type them in there, and we'll just take them as they come. Um, if you have them. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about distribution channels because it's kind of a hot topic here. And, and you mentioned Dubai being kind of a strange model yeah. um, where you can get your tickets really anywhere. It's starting over here a bit, um, but you know because we've got now Costco wrote a deal with Ticketmaster to where mm -hmm. um, you know through an API they can pick up tickets at you know online at Costco. And there are yeah. some that think the distribution channel is the way to go. Um, I'm one looking at it thinking, you know, there's a lot that can go wrong in that and I'm pretty protective of inventory thinking that, you know, the venue doesn't want a bunch of lists coming in or however they're delivering and then people don't know who they bought from. So then they come in and they say, well, you didn't buy from us. A little bit like um, the, the travel market. It used to be that you would buy from a travel agent or you'd buy from Expedia or Orbitz or something like that, and you get to your hotel, you want to change your room, and I'm like, sorry, we can't touch your reservation because you yeah. didn't make it for us. So right. I stopped doing that a long time ago, and now the mm -hmm. hotels and the airlines are all pushing everybody to their sites. Double points if you book on our site. Uh, yeah. We can manage the thing for you. I kind of get what they're doing now, and I think they're looking at it that we don't need that distribution channel anymore. Right. Um, we still have a lot of people coming to us pitching that they're going to distribute tickets in a better way than we can or that mm -hmm. our venues can. Um, what do you see in Australia and New Zealand? On, is, is it still really, is the primary ticketer and the primary venue still the main source for distribution? Are they holding pretty tight to that? Yeah, absolutely it is there. I mean, um, I think the only exception to, to that would be secondary ticketing and right. the, se the secondary ticketing players um, other than Ticketmaster um, have run into a lot of resistance from the industry and they're all based outside of Australia. So StubHub, right. who are tiny in, in Australia and New Zealand, um, but have tried to spend money to get in. Um, but Viagogo and um, uh, or, you know those guys in particular um, have had a lot of problems. Um, their customers have had a, a lot of problems, but they're still a small percentage. Um, creates a lot of noise because you know we'll have people turning up to the Australian Open Tennis that have flown from Europe, the UK and with Viagogo tickets that aren't valid and they've spent tens of thousands of dollars to go to this event. Right. Um, right. And they get their, you know, 
eighty bucks refunded for their ticket, but nothing else. Um, so there's, that that generates a lot of a lot of noise and a lot of complaints, and and rightly so. Um, but yeah, it's still absolutely the primary ticketing companies who you know um, there's 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 Ticket Tech, there's Ticketmaster, and um, Moshtix, who are a smaller player who focus on clubs and, and music festivals. Um, all have fairly decent outlet networks, um, you know, in, in most of the big venues, um, online, big call centres, et, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and, yeah. and the, the venue market there is less fractured. It's mostly government owned. It's, 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 mm. yeah, and it's, a, it's a small market. Um, in Asia, we've been doing a lot of work in Asia over the last two years, um, and that's quite fragmented. Um, you know, it's still people lining up at the shopping mall for 12 or 15 really? hours to get tickets. Um, and partly that's because the platforms, <laughs> the platforms they're using can't handle anything else. And partly it's um, labor's a lot cheaper. That's, a, that's another factor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and something like the West End is still completely fragmented, right? Um, what, what has happened, yep. and this is, this is true with the airlines and hotels, is where 15 years ago they didn't have the technology to run all of these distribution channels. Most mm-hmm. of these inventory owners do now. The airlines mm-hmm. have decent online booking sites for the most part. Um, so do the hotels. Um, and, you know, they're just, they're just licensing platforms to do this stuff. And, and the, same, the same is true for even the smallest theatre in the West End now has a system that can connect into... Um, some of the bigger agencies and sell tickets and, and sell them in real time off their manifest. So that, that has definitely changed and it's given, you know, it's, it's shifted control between the parties. And what's the right answer? Um, it depends, right? It's, um, right. you know, sometimes these, sometimes these deals happen, like something like, a, you know, the Costco Ticketmaster deal, Um might make a lot of sense in certain markets in the US, right? Um, we, like we were just talking about, people who don't have printers at home, um, you know, if they can go down to a, a Costco and print out their tickets, that might make a lot of sense. And there might be markets where they have lower online penetration for, for sales, particularly high value sales. You might have markets where people want to pay cash. In South America, we, we still see a lot of cash paying markets. Um, right, that's true. And that's why that's why they maintain out- outlets where where they perhaps wouldn't otherwise. Um, so I think the answer is always is it depends. I think you have to be mindful of as as an existing inventory owner or or someone who has who has a, a piece in the value chain. You have to be mindful of what you might be giving up. Right. Um, and da- data is often a big play in these things. If these transactions are happening off platform, and you're right. just getting the, the the ticketing and the, the dollars piece coming through and you're losing your customer data, then that can be problematic. Um, and some of those big deals do, um, you, you've got to be mindful. But they might come in and say, we'll, we'll provide all the technology and the platforms, we'll pay for it all. We might even mm-hmm. you know, pay you a sponsorship um, or something like that. But you will always be giving something up in, in return for that. They always say that they're after the unsold inventory. So they come in and right. they say, look, you've got X number of percent of tickets that are never sold so we're going to help you sell those somehow you know and and that's always the pitch Um, but you know it's not something that I recommend you know that our venues really jump at because you do often have to give up cost or data or whatever that whatever that mean or you know with Groupon you may look at it and go well I got some new buyers well did you but are you going to get the data to be able to convert them to repeat buyers Um, and so it really just um, you know, I don't really buy that. I, I think we, between the ticket companies and the venues, um, have to develop our own reach rather than look at a bunch of distribution channels. I mean, it, but it's just, I was just interested to see it. It's, it's nice to hear, I think, because um, I want my viewpoint validated that Australia and, and New Zealand are, um, you know, sticking close to the, the venue owns the manifest, basically. And um, I, I did a little interview talking about the Amazon deal because it was saying they were trying to get into ticketing. And I thought, well, they're going to have to build some massive new product that's not out there and then go make deals with venues if they really want to get into ticketing. And it, it's too slow. You know, I, I can't see that as being something, you know, maybe they, they end up, you know, acquiring Eventbrite or something like that down the road where they can do some of those GA events that are a little easier to manage, um, those types yeah. of things. You start getting into, 
the reserve seats and all the things that we know are really tough about ticketing and, and again all that access control um, you know I don't know how they're doing that in the end I think they want deals for their prime members and we can do that you know right. that's easy that's like the Amex deals that's like put your prime member in get a discount um, anything we can do on the primary side to partner to give deals to Amex Visa Prime that makes much more sense but then we're still holding on to the manifest and the data right. so. I mean that, that my view is they'll do something um, Mm -hmm. I don't think it's I don't think it's going to bother them too much that it will take them a long time. They've shown themselves to be pretty good at taking long bets. Um, <laughs> yes. What they've what they've done in the UK is you know they've licensed some software and and they they go and buy the tickets. So so it can be a pretty good deal for a promoter. Are they buying like of inventory, they'll buy, almost they'll, like a yeah. Inventory. They'll buy a block of yeah. tickets and, and and sell it. So it's not even on consignment. It's like they'll just buy it off you and then and then they'll sell it and they'll sell it. Fee free and, and cares all about of that. that. That's fine. So and, and you know they're 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 putting some margin in there. So they're um, you know they're coming in and saying, hey, we'll buy a hundred tickets from you, and we want to pay a bit less, and we're we're going to sell them for what we think we can sell them, and and they'll take some risk. And and I think in the West End, that's probably a really good um, position for them to take. Um, I think I think they'll definitely try to do something in um, in North America. Certainly, um, I mean it's it's a Huge transactional market. The, the the dollars that flow through ticketing are just off the charts, and Everybody all, of, all of us all of us take our you know a couple of nickels here and there and and um, yeah. um, make our living. But it, it, it is massive amounts of money in the in the in entertainment yep. ticket. Um, and so I think they would see it as an opportunity. I think you know they'll run in, into all of the usual challenges as the long term contracts as um, you know a lot of um, long-term investment in terms of infrastructure, relationships, dollars on the table, dollars not on the table, in, in, in all of these deals, that's how the, the industry works. So they'll, they'll run into that. I, I think they'll, they'll probably figure something out eventually. I'm sure they will. All right. Um, do we have any questions, Taylor? We don't. We were fully, ex we just expounded on everything and left no room for question. <laughs> Um, again, if you have any, you can certainly forward them to our marketing team. Um, it's taylor at ticketforest.com. She can forward them on to Greg. Um, but thank you for your time and spending You're your welcome. evening with us. And, uh, hopefully the kids are tucked in bed by now. Okay. And uh, well, you, you can go peek at them a little bit. Rest well. He, uh, Greg's off to Asia tomorrow. And then we appreciate him taking this time for us. Love working with you, Greg. Um, appreciate having everything that you bring to this industry um, to us and we look forward to lots of years ahead of working together so thanks thank very much likewise, likewise right. thank you. Cheers. Thanks. safe travels Bye. thank you everybody Cheers. that ends our Bye. webinar today